Tauri ora, i te tū tahi e tuku atu i te honore, ki te matua tama wairu tapu me ngā nahiro pono ko te māngai hei tau toku mai ai nei āki nei ai. Nō reira rā e ngā mana e ngā reo, e ngā kāranga tanga maha, nā mahara mai whakatau mai ki tēnei momo hui hui ngā ko whakarite ai e koutou i tēnei wā. Nei rā te mihi o te haukainga o ngai tu huriri ki a koutou i rungi te kāranga o tēnei a tātou kaupapa. Nō reira ngā poroporo ā ki ngā mate maha, ngā mate ka wanganui a koutou, ka wanganui a mātou. Ka piti hono tātai hono te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. Ka piti hono tātai hono te hunga ora ki te hunga ora. Ati hei mauri ora. So in translation, firstly I give thanks to the creator and author of all life, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so on behalf of our hau kainga, mana whenua of the local hapu of this area of Waitaha, I formally welcome you here, although you're not here physically, the, this virtual welcome will intertwine us spiritually for your you one's conference that you're hosting from here, in the manner of speaking. And so in my address, I also acknowledge those of our loved ones, those of our ancestors who have passed beyond the world of living. You have grieved, we have grieved, and together we have farewelled them from the world of the living and hope that they remain in the peace and the serenity of the heavens above. So look, the, the, the process for Tuahuriri and Haukainga is very simple. We just want to extend our art of manaki, our art of welcome to all of you here. And so what I'm going to do this morning is give a blessing to formally open your conference. And in that whakamoemiti, in that blessing, we will give thanks to Ihua for all of what he has given us to date and ask that he gives us the spiritual, the emotional, in the physical blessings to carry out this conference. So on that note, we're going to get straight into it. And then I will finish off with a himine from our hahi, and then I will hand it back to you once and vacate or leave this hui. So on that note, Ken, kia inoi tato, let us pray. Nō re reto mātou matanui te rangi, Tuku mai to ha to raha no ke rungi ki a mātou e hui hui nei. Muru a mātou harame mātou ngoi kore tanga. Whakaukia to ha to raha no ke rotu ki a mātou i tēnei wā. Ke whai hua a mātou kōrero ke raro i te tā huhu o tēnei a tātou nei hui hui nga. I roti tō koutou kororei a tanga. Homa ano ki a mātou piki te ora piki te kaha. Piki te mārama tanga ki a mātou tinana ki a mātou ngākau me a mātou wairua. Ko koutou anō nei te timata tanga me te whakautinga. Mai a mātou e te mano kutia atu nei, i roti tō koutou kororei a tanga, ko te māngai hei tau toko mai, ai nei ake nei ai. So on that note, just want to reiterate, reinforce our welcome from the haukainga from here. And um, it, it's a bit of a, a spiritual one for me because I only live next door to our marae. And so we, I'm literally welcoming you from our village, our village here in Tua, here we are, our, our past site. So welcome, twice welcome, thrice welcome. On that note, tihe mauri ora. Te whetu, te whetu marama, marama o te, o te hahi ratana, ratana te whetu, te whetu marama, Marama o te, o te hahiratana. Welcome, twice welcome, thrice welcome. Tihe mauri ora, kia ora tātou. Thank you, Micah, that was amazing, beautiful. Thank you. Good luck on your meeting. Thank you.
And no my Heidi my everyone, welcome to this third session. It's uh, the virtual roadshow around New Zealand. And today we're going to be in Christchurch. So Matt Miles is going to be taking you through um, what we're going to be going through today. But for the fellows that have just come in, this is a way for you to be able to compare all the different cities and regions of New Zealand, have a look at all the different subsectors that they have and what they are strong for. Most um, regions are strong in technology, but it's what is that the enabler of? What else have they got that's their strength? And then also you'll learn today about demographics, statistics of the region, and then the, the, the sectors, and you'll hear about case studies and you'll hear from companies. So today we've got uh, the granary, you've got Amber sitting there, and then uh, you'll also hear from a couple of the fellows that have moved to the region or actually are in the region as well. So I'll hand it over to you, Matt, and thank you. It's going to be a great session. Thanks, Michelle, and kia ora, everyone. I'll just share my screen and open up the slideshow. Bear with me two seconds. So yeah, so my name is Matt Wiles and I'm the investment lead here at Christchurch NZ. And it's my absolute pleasure to be here to introduce you to the Edmund Hillary Foundation Christchurch Regional Showcase. We're extremely excited to be able to talk to you about our wonderful city and give you a glimpse of the opportunity that exists here in Otatahi, Christchurch. We've got a stellar lineup of speakers who will highlight our key sectors, share what it's like to live and work here, and also tell their story about how they fit into our local ecosystem. I'm joined by Jamie Todd, who looks after business attraction, and I will hand over to him to tell you more about Christchurch NZ and the role that we play in creating a place of innovation, exploration, and vibrancy. Jamie. Thanks, Matt. Uh, kia ora, everyone. My name is Jamie Todd, as Matt said. I focus on the business attraction here at Christchurch NZ. Well, today, Christchurch is one of the most economically resilient and fastest growing regions in New Zealand. We've learned a fair bit about overcoming challenges beyond our control, and the economic diversity which underpins the region has created a strong level of resilience and a focus on the future through sustainable economic growth. Christchurch is a city that explores opportunity through our innovation ecosystem and was proudly named by NZ Entrepreneur magazine as New Zealand's startup boomtown. It's the perfect testing environment with a collaborative business culture, ensuring entrepreneurs feel connected, supported, and importantly, thrive. We have a depth of talent across multiple sectors, including professional services, agri-tech, health tech, creative industries, manufacturing, and engineering, to name just a few. Our world-class universities work with industry to grow future-focused, work-ready graduates, while the city's affordability unbeatable lifestyle and easy commutes attract and retain the best in the field. So I think one of the one of the things we won't do is share with you lots of economic data. Um, we've got you know a very vast list of speakers from a wide range of you know topics. We've got Marion Johnson who's going to talk about the innovation ecosystem. Um, and I think you know we can see some of the some of the companies that are coming out there doing a great job. Um, and we've also got Mark Rocket, who's going to talk about probably one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest sectors in the whole of Christchurch with aerospace. Um, and then we're going to pass over to Amy, who's going to talk about the Christchurch Foundation here, who do some great work. We've got Bridget from Bead and Proceed, who's going to talk about their social enterprise, and also Amber Marie from the Granary, who's going to talk about the reasons why they moved down here and their amazing technology that they work with in the screen industry. But first of all, I'll show you a little video. Ōtautahi Christchurch, at the heart of New Zealand's central South Island. Explore riverside markets, hot pools and sand dunes, zip lines in the hills, and street art wherever you look. Christchurch is just the beginning. Head north to family-run wineries, thermal pools, and stunning wildlife. Traverse the majestic Southern Alps westward to bushlands and glaciers, limestone arches, and character towns. Head south to experience alpine adventure amongst New Zealand's tallest mountains. Discover serene blue lakes, and indulge in the local cuisine. The Central South Island is ready and waiting to wow you. So, 
Get out there and explore. Okay, so before I hand over to Marion, we talked about I talk, she's going to talk about the innovation ecosystem and the, the amazing startup system that we've got going on here. But just as a little teaser, we'll introduce you to a company that probably a lot of you will know, someone who's come through Teohaka and are now doing some great things here in Christchurch. My name's Nathan and I'm from Partly and we came up with our business idea from this caravan. At our flat, we had one guy living in the caravan, one in the house. We used to come in here every morning, fold up the bed, bring in a, a table, have one of Technical issues. One of us sitting here, one sitting there, one at, at the desk over there, and one sort of in a cubby hole at the back. 12 hours a day, developing, coding, writing, just full on. What we're doing is we're creating a universal standard for auto parts and also for vehicles and the relationship between auto parts and vehicles. A part on average fits 30 or 40 different vehicles and knowing which parts fit which specific vehicles in different regions around the world is a, it's a big problem and we solve that through, through software. It's been fundamental to our growth that we have been a part of Tauhaka. Being in a place where you're not alone you are with other companies that are facing similar problems to you. Either you're constantly bouncing ideas off other startups. This time last year, we were four guys. In the past six months, really, we've grown to 10, um, expanding to 20 over the next 12 months, uh, with customers across 13 different countries, and just raised a seed round of 1.7 million. And we couldn't have done it, really, without, without the help of Tauhaka and the whole startup ecosystem in Christchurch. Marion, over to you. Thanks for that fantastic intro. Um, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. My name is Marion Johnson. I'm the Chief Executive at Ministry of Awesome here in Christchurch. And uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to show you are um, just an introduction to the Canterbury Startup and Innovation Ecosystem. So it all started um, specifically you know, for me and for the team at Ministry of Awesome. Um, sorry, Matt, are you going to push the slides forward? I'll just say next. Yep. Uh, on the 22nd of Feb, 2011, um, when obviously we had a catastrophic earthquake here in the city and the city was no longer, I mean, the whole city center was destroyed. Um, many of our, our lives were completely disrupted. Um, and there began a complete reimagining of what the city could be um, and how it could um, potentially lead New Zealand. Next slide. So you may not know this, but we used to be called the Garden City. And actually I was in New Zealand two years before the earthquake and it definitely was the Garden City. It was a city full of, well, gardens, um, beautiful heritage buildings. Um, and once the earthquake happened, we really had to quickly reimagine ourselves. An organization called the Ministry of Awesome was formed and it was really a city making organization. Um, at the same time that I took over at the end of 2017, um, there were new uh, leadership, there was new leadership at organizations like Christchurch NZ, our economic development agency, um, through to the chamber, through to the university. Um, and it became very quickly um, clear that the pathway we're heading towards was the city of innovation, specifically focusing on four super nodes. Um, and those super nodes are aerospace and future transport, food and fiber, med tech, health tech, and high tech in general underpinning all of them. So the picture that you can see in the background is actually Emily Blythe, uh, who was the founder um, and her team members work, working on their um, drone, which disseminates um, the um, hydroscopic powder, which clears airport fog um, from airports around the world. It's an $85 billion uh, problem. Um, and Piper Vision, which was born here in Christchurch um, is, um, is solving that rapidly. Next slide. So um, once it became clear that we were positioning ourselves as the city in innovation, and once it was clear um, that we were focusing on those key super nodes, it also became clear that we were going to have to very quickly develop a pipeline of high growth startups and innovators. At that time, 
anyone who was founding a high growth startup was generally thinking, there's nothing here for me. This is the garden city. Um, there is no sort of startup ecosystem. There was the beginnings of some, but really it was all happening in Wellington and in Auckland where there were actually formal programs in place and accelerators in place and where funding was much more readily available. And of course, funding was also extremely tight at that point. Um, and so therefore, Ministry of Awesome completely pivoted from the city making that it had been doing over the last five years through to focusing on developing a high growth startup pipeline. And just a fast fact, in developed economies, up to 70% of all of our new job growth comes from high growth startups. So we knew exactly how important, how important those startup founders were going to be in terms of achieving our goals. Next slide, please. So another thing that was a, a massive factor is that you know previously in Christchurch, we were very much focused on primary industry, lots of dairying, lots of farming, lots of supply um, to those industries. And now more than ever in Christchurch and in New Zealand, we needed more startup founders to alleviate that reliance on primary industry and also to, um, to ensure that we had global relevance in terms of developing future world leading industries. Next slide. So um, I don't know if any of you follow Startup Genome, but they have a, a pretty strong formula in terms of where we find ourselves, um, depending on, on where a startup ecosystem actually is in the stage of development. And in New Zealand, the stage that New Zealand is at is activation phase, which is one of the early phases. And the jobs that need to be done in that activation phase are these three jobs. And this is exactly what um, our strategy is pinned on. So the first one is we need to be role modeling, storytelling, essentially making startups a thing. And the second step is we have to be identifying talent and building capability, making sure that everyone is really connected and making sure that there's a pipeline of investment so that the startup founders who do have that high capability, who have affected product market fit, can easily find investment for the next stage of growth. And the third thing that we needed to do is we needed to essentially create entrepreneurial density. So it was no good having a high growth startup founder over here and another high growth startup founder over there and investors in this pocket and investors in that pocket. We basically had to squish them all together, create that density so they could start meeting each other, firing off each other. And then we needed to make sure that we had all of the key partners in the room um, to engineer that serendipity um, that would lead to those collisions um, that would benefit everyone in terms of developing that startup and innovation pipeline. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of Ministry of Awesome, we're a force for New Zealand startups and innovators. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time on this in, in this deck on Think Lab because it's not in my organization, but it's our sister organization. So Think Lab is based at the University of Canterbury and where Think Lab sits is generally working on that growth phase, um, but also working very um, specifically with those startups that are potentially around commercializing deep tech. Um, so for example, the engineering school at the University of Canterbury is extremely strong um, and innovation that comes out of that engineering school is something that might go directly into Think Lab um, to, to work on how they might commercialize um, their startup. Ministry of Awesome is generally mostly founder led. So this is essentially not necessarily deep tech, although we do have some deep tech in the portfolio. This is mostly founder led startups who are coming in from a position of having found a problem out in industry and um, teaming up with a technical co-founder and then building their startup from there. Next slide, please. So the focus at Ministry of Awesome is at the very top of the pipeline. Um, so that, that sort of uh, swampy uh, body of water you see there, we're trying to turn that into a torrent. Um, we just need to have more volume coming into the top of the pipeline in order for startups, high growth startups and in innovators to be able to trickle down to the next stages um, of growth. Um, so our focus is completely around making sure that we get that volume into the top of the pipeline ensuring we connect them, ensuring that um, they, they have everything that they need to go along to the next step. Next slide, please. So job one, um, as I mentioned in that earlier slide is making startups a thing. Next slide, please. So a real example of how we might make startups a thing is a conference that just recently happened in uh, Christchurch. Um, it was actually phenomenal, Electrify Aotearoa, 
which was focusing on women high growth startup founders. Um, it took place two weeks ago. We had 400 women from all across the country um, coming to the Isaac Theater Royal. And um, essentially we had these amazing role models of um, high growth startup founders who are women um, talking about their journey and essentially role modeling the opportunity of startup and showing um, how, how it can be done. Next slide, please. So that was the ad poster. This was the reality. Um, it was an all day event um, and it was, it was truly electrifying. And essentially this was the thunderclap for women startup founders in our country to really connect us all and to create a girls club that could com combat the impact of the boys club. I mean, less than 2% of um, venture capital goes to women founded startups, 83% to all boy founded startups. Um, so obviously this is an area that we were focusing on for this specific event, role modeling and making sure women are coming into the top of that startup pipeline. Next slide, please. Um, an example of job number two, which is all around identifying that talent, building capability, connecting and investment pipelines. Next slide, please is the incubator that we run at Te Ohaka. So Te Ohaka means the nest in Te Reo, um, and we run an incubator there called Founder Catalyst. Uh, Founder Catalyst is generally around 30 high growth startup founders at a time um, going through those early stages. So we'll take people at about pre-MVP, uh, generally pre-revenue, um, and what we're trying to do over the nine months that we have those startup founders is establish product market fit and get that first seed round in um, for those startup founders who are actually raising. Next slide, please. Um, so job number three is the building of that entrepreneurial density and that cute line around engineering serendipity and some examples of that we'll see on the next slide. So something that we recently uh, worked on last year was the first year, and we'll be doing it again um, in a couple of weeks time, is uh, we launched the Orion Energy Accelerator in uh, 2021. Um, it was powered by Ministry of Awesome, and we were partnered with um, Ara Ake, which is the National uh, Future Energy Hub of New Zealand. And essentially what we were looking for there is energy innovators, energy startups who are focused on driving sustainability um, in, uh, in energy creation, as well as um, uh, addressing um, power poverty. Um, the results of that were pretty phenomenal. Out of the 10 teams that went through the accelerator, um, four of them now have either gone on to um, uh, commercializing their product um, and have raised their first seed, round, seed rounds. Um, to find out a little bit more about that, you can get onto the Orion um, Energy Accelerator website. Um, and uh, and I, there we have some reports of uh, some of the successful founders from last year. Um, and we have a call to action for new founders to come in um, in a couple of weeks time when it launches again. Next slide, please. Another example of that engineering serendipity. Um, and essentially what we're trying to say there is we're trying to bring in larger organizations, corporates to lean into the startup ecosystem. So rather than startups trying to solve problems that they hope to find a customer for, we're trying to find the big customer to tell us what their problems are and then having startups solve for their, their problems. Um, and that's what we did with the Orion Energy Accelerator um, and now with the Health Tech Supernode Challenge. So we're in our second year of the Health Tech Supernode Challenge. Um, and essentially, again, this is the same thing again, a call to action, action nationally for high growth startup founders and innovators who are working in a particular um, sector and working on specific problems. And then when they apply to come in and they run through the accelerator, we're identifying, we're identifying talent, we're um, helping driving their capability, we're ensuring that they're networked into the right organizations, and we're essentially pushing them on their way um, through the, the pipeline. Next slide, please. So since May 2019, this is, these are numbers that are specific to um, Founder Catalyst at Te Ohaka. Uh, since May 2019, we've worked with 87 startups in our incubator. 
um, from those 87 startups, we've had um, 18 million capital raised and created 168 new jobs. And just bear in mind that the startups are coming in pre MVP many times, pre revenue many times. So when we're talking about raising capital, we're not talking about raising $4 million rounds. Sometimes we're talking about raising as little as $100,000. So all those $100,000 rounds adding up to 18 million um, is, uh, is a good start for the startups that have been going through the incubator. Next slide, please. Um, here's just a slide that I borrowed from um, the Angel Association at Ice House. And this is actually uh, probably about two years old now. And if you look at the top right corner, you've got Zero Rocket Lab, Lanza Tech. Um, Sequent is a uh, local um, uh, startup that is now in the, um, I guess, Unicorn Club. Um, and here we have about 400 plus high growth startups. Uh, this is two, two years ago. Um, and there are uh, two years ago, we're creating 10,000 plus high value jobs. Next slide. Um, again, a reiteration of why startup founders uh, and why we're concentrating on this. Why does New Zealand think this is so important? It's really these four, these four pieces. Startup founders um, are responsible for rapid job creation. Um, they do thrive in uncertain times. Um, they have an outside con outsized contribution to those government imperatives around sustainability, well-being, industry transformation, et cetera. Um, and they will also lead to our global relevance and leadership on the world stage. Next slide, please. So you may or may not know this, but New Zealand um, at the Electrify Aotearoa um, conference last week, uh, the New Zealand government announced um, the very first New Zealand Startup Council, which is six advisors to a startup council advising the government on any policies and strategies that the government might affect that would impact the startup ecosystem. And this is really important because what it means is that New Zealand uh, and the New Zealand government is really recognizing the impact that high growth startup and innovation can have on the country and on the world. So these are the goals that we put forward when we were asking the New Zealand government to create that startup council. Um, we were saying that delivered by delivering by 2030, we wanted to see 10,000 active high growth startups. Uh, we're now at, um, I think it was it, was it 4,000, um, 500,000 future focused jobs, a GDP uplift of 10 billion. Uh, we need to see an enormous productivity uplift. Uh, we're aiming for a carbon neutral economy. We'd like to build a high value economy that has a better equity and diversity across the entire sector. And that we're trying to make sure that high growth entrepreneurship is part of the Kiwi DNA. So this is the New Zealand ambition. I've talked a little bit about the Christchurch and Canterbury ambition, um, but they're very much aligned. Um, and this is what our goals are. There's a lot of work to do, but we're definitely heading in the right direction. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Marianne. That's um, amazing numbers there. And I think anyone who attended Electrify last week um, can testify to how how amazing the event was. Um, and yeah, I know we we spend a lot of time down at Teohaka and it's amazing to see the sort of the outputs and the companies that are coming through every week and how, they, how they're growing. Um, now moving on to something a bit more specialist, um, I'll pass over to Mark Rocket to talk about aerospace in Christchurch. Thanks, Matt. Tim Koto Koto, great to be here in the session. I'll give a snapshot of some of the interesting aerospace projects underway in Canterbury, New Zealand. Uh, yeah, in 2018, a group of us started running local aerospace meetups, and this developed into an industry body that's now called Aerospace Christchurch. We work on a range of initiatives to support the industry, and a key one for us was in 2019, where we secured funding from the New Zealand Space Agency to develop a regional space strategy. And this helped align all of the key stakeholders in the region. And, and things are progressing nicely and we've, we're starting to see uh, some, some great activity and we're working with entities around New Zealand to help build an aerospace nation. We, we were the 11th country in the world to develop orbital capable rockets. And here in 2022, we have a thriving aerospace ecosystem that is really starting to build momentum. Next slide. So, yeah, essentially we're an industry body made up of industry participants. 
uh, we see aerospace as being space businesses and also advanced aviation type companies. Next slide. So our mission is to create a internationally acclaimed aerospace business hub that exceeds $50 million revenue by 2030. And our vision is in 2030, Spaceport Christchurch will be a major Southern Hemisphere gateway to space. Next slide. So you may be wondering why Christchurch? You know, what have we got to offer the international aerospace industry? Well, Christchurch is an ideal location for flight testing and has relatively less air traffic and has stable weather. We have available airspace. New Zealand is surrounded by water and there's you know, a very low population density compared to the Northern Hemisphere. We have dedicated flight test areas. We are a gateway to another extreme environment, the Antarctic, with hundreds of researchers passing through our city. Christchurch is also New Zealand's second largest manufacturing hub, but we don't have all the traffic and housing problem that Auckland has, so there's a certain ease of business here. We have a number of other compelling selling points, but if you put them all together, Christchurch is a great place to develop an aerospace technology company. Next up, I'm going to be talking through some interesting projects that are on our uh, radar. And I'll start off talking about my favorite company, Kia Aerospace. I'm the CEO, so I'm a, I'm a little bit biased, but Kia Aerospace is developing an uncrewed solar powered aircraft that will fly in the stratosphere for months at a time. We'll, we have a focus of developing high resolution aerial imagery uh, for applications such as environmental monitoring, precision agriculture, forestry, smart cities, maritime domain awareness, and disaster management. Next. Dawn Aerospace are developing an uncrewed rocket plane that will fly into space. And they also have a substantive part of their business developing small thrusters for satellites. Next. Uh, Merlin Labs have received a heap of Google investment to fly planes autonomously. And yeah, it looks like they're going to be based in Northland, but their CEO is on our Aerospace Cross Church Committee, and they will be doing some activity down here as well as in the North Island. Next. Hyper Vision have developed technology to disperse fog, as Mary mentioned in the previous presentation. And they're using drone, drones and have contact with various New Zealand airports and uh, starting to do some very interesting work. Next. Skybase, like Merlin Labs, are working on systems to take the pilot out of the plane, and they are making excellent progress on this. Next, Swoop have their global HQ in Melbourne, and their New Zealand operation is based here in Christchurch. They have been doing drone delivery services around the world. Next, Whisk have received about $700 million of investment from Boeing, the aircraft development is well advanced. And in June, they were doing a lot of test flights around the Tikapo area here in Canterbury. Next. Tafaki is an exciting joint venture between two local Runanga and the Crown, who invested $16 million in purchasing land on the Kaitariti spit. It will be used as an R&D test area for many of the companies I've talked about so far. And ultimately, It'd be great if there's a place where hardware can be launched into space. Next. The University of Canterbury has a great aerospace pedigree. In fact, in the 1960s, they launched suborbital rockets into space from the Kaitariti spit, and they've been a producer of incredible talent. Oh, they did that launch with NASA, by the way. Uh, and a bunch of the team in, in the Rocket Lab control room are actually graduates of Dr. Chris Hahn. Uh, as is my business partner, Dr. Philip Sultrop. And you know, Dr. Chris Hahn has been doing some great work there at the University of Canterbury, as well as a, a bunch of other uh, people in different faculties. Next. So Aerospace Christchurch has meetups, and they started in 2018, and, and they've been a really popular way for aerospace participants, stakeholders, and interested parties to network and hear about what's going on around Canterbury and the country. Next. Uh, I just wanted to finish up mentioning that we have an inaugural New Zealand Aerospace Summit here in Christchurch at Tapai on September 5th. And it'll be the first time that we bring together all of New Zealand's key aerospace participants. So that's going to be a pretty exciting event and we're really looking forward to that. Next. 
So yeah, that's a brief overview of some of the aerospace activity going on. Um, thank you. And yeah, feel free to get in touch with us through our website, Christchurch.space. Thanks, Matt. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, and I think just to touch on aerospace, I've had the um, good fortune to be involved in a few aerospace challenges um, and organizing parts of some of the summit. Um, and it's just amazing to see what's happening in that space, to excuse the pun, but yeah, there's a lot going on and it's, I mean, the future's huge. Um, and that aerospace summit coming to Christchurch is going to be absolutely amazing. So looking forward to that. Um, and now I'll hand over to Amy, who's going to talk about the Christchurch Foundation. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, I'll uh, apologise in advance. I'm coming from COVID central at the moment. So if I start coughing, um, bear with me. Um, so the Christchurch Foundation is a, a, a response established by the Mayor Leanne Dalziel to the understanding that for successful Western democracies to thrive, you need a strong business economy, a strong governance or leadership, um, both from the central and local government. Uh, really strong media, but also the, the significance of a strong and thriving not-for-profit sector is the glue that often holds all those sorts of communities together. Um, and so we were established as a direct result of the Christchurch earthquakes in 2010 and 2011, where there was um, a, a gap missing in our infrastructure. Next slide, please. So our purpose is to effectively act like Tinder. Um, we're a matching service between donors and um, generous, uh, generous people, organizations, and great causes here in Greater Ōtutahi Christchurch. So we include Salwan and Waimakariri in our area. Um, and um, <clears throat> we, we don't really care where people give to as long as it's smart and informed. Uh, we're 100% focused on impact and making a difference for our residents and our community. And we're acknowledged as being uh, world leading uh, in some of their responses. You, you may have seen us um, for our work we did around March 15. So we led on behalf of the mayor and the prime minister in that response and then acted as advocates for that community for a year and a half um, as part of DPMC's outreach program. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're all about making Greater Christchurch better uh, to make it short and sweet. Thanks, next slide, please. Uh, and you've heard a little bit in these conversations before about how wonderful we are. So there's our beautiful city and we just keep clicking through Matt or Jamie who was pushing the button. Stunning landscape. We're a city surrounded by nature and what's better is we're a new city with new infrastructure. Kind of think of us as Goldilocks. Not too big, not too small. We're just right, which means we're an ideal situation to innovate, lead and make a difference, uh, not only here in New Zealand, but globally as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> but what we do know from our own research is that our people, like everywhere in Western world, are feeling lonely, isolated and disconnected. So what is our role as um, a, sim, uh, as a catalyst organisation to help address that? Next slide, please. So what we've learned, you know, we had a bit of a bad run there over the last 10 years. We've had earthquakes, fires, narrow plague. Uh, I think we're just missing um, a few other things that have happened to this community. But what it's done is taught us a lot, which is that we must listen and empower to it and empower people. And the Christchurch Foundation has that at the core of all that we're doing. Thank you. Next slide. So we did some research. So when we've got smart people, whether they're here or based somewhere else in the world or a big corporate, when we're working with them to decide where they should invest their philanthropic dollar, it's really important to understand community aspirations. So on that um, basis, we conducted uh, uh, some research called Vital Signs, asking residents of Greater Christchurch what was important to them uh, and where we should prioritize philanthropic investment here. Um, and that vital science research has been invaluable. It's now actually been fed into the, the long-term planning of Greater Christchurch for the 2050 as well. Um, and that vital science research can be found on our website. Thanks for sharing that, Michelle. Next slide, please. So what it did was help us understand a few things. We've got people that are feeling not connected to place, to planet, or to other people. So we've got a strategic approach to grow healthy giving, to encourage participation of our residents, create connections within communities, and empower people across Greater Christchurch. Next slide, please which leads to these priorities, which are the priorities set by our people, reducing inequality, creating strengths within the communities, and a huge focus on the concept of kaitiakitanga. 
Thanks, next slide. So where did that give us? In 2019, Vital Signs told our community that these were our areas of prioritisation. So making our place vibrant and exciting place to live and visit is a really important focus. Kaitiakitanga, stewardship of our environment. People um, wanted a city, a modern version of a garden city and its surrounding districts, a place where you could connect with nature, where um, it was sustainable, where energy was used, it was clean. Um, and also we wanted to be a place that stood up against inequality um, and that's proud in our history you know we've, we were the first place in the world to legislise a woman's right to an education we led the global women's rights movement with Kate Shepard and her peers um, not only was it someone in Canterbury that split the atom we then lent uh, led the global nuclear free movement so we are a proud region at, at evolving and shaping depending on what our community and the world needs so those are our three strate strategic areas of investment um, and that's what we inform our donors about whether they're a corporate something like a meridian energy or uh, an expat sitting in london um, we help guide and inform them with good data next slide please uh, so what does that look, look like? We've applied it against the sustainable uh, the SDGs, uh, which we'll hear a bit, a bit more about from Bridget soon, but um, that's quite important to understand. And those are the strategic priorities that our community has set, and it gives you a little bit more of an overview. And the next slide shows you some of the programs that we're already actively delivering in that space to um, deliver outcomes along that. So we're a community foundation. That's the fastest growing movement of philanthropy globally. Uh, we are one of 17 across the world, uh, across New Zealand. There's thousands of them across the world. Um, but what's different about us is we're bespoke to what our community wanted and we're actually proactively establishing funds that are aligned to community aspiration to make it easier for people to get involved and invest in our community, whether it's $5 or 5 million. Um, so some of the projects were delivered there, Te Ahu Pātiki, um, we strategically partnered with um, a, a charitable trust here, they have um, been a government, they're a council controlled entity, never had to raise money, but they had a strategic objective of purchasing the two highest peaks on uh, Banks Peninsula for permanent protection and reforestation. We provided the strategic framework to fundraise and then help them capital raise. It's just another form of capital raising. Um, over $600,000 to purchase those uh, to Maonga and Taonga, which are now back in permanent public protection and will be um, re-established into bush. Um, so you can see the sort of programs of work that are sitting there, but we also work as an advisor to donors and if they want to establish a fund with a specific objective, we'll do that as well. And we call those donor advised funds. So this is our fifth year, <coughs> excuse me, of operation. We've raised over $17 million, distributed 13 million of that back into the community already. Um, and we have a global outreach program. I run a sister charity in the UK <coughs> and about to launch one in the US as well, which tax incentivizes is giving for our expat community back here. Next slide, please. So that's what we're about, making the city better. So it's strategic philanthropy that's uh, world leading, has a big focus on our global alumni. Um, and we're all about making a difference. So we've just partnered with uh, um, the Next Foundation and they've conducted an impact review of us and we're working with them to build a world leading impact framework. Uh, there's an expert sitting here in Christchurch called Rose Challies, who's one of the top ones in the world. Um, so we can measure indices. So every program of work that we do, um, we know if we're actually making a difference. So we can then go back to our philanthropic investors and say, yes, no, it's not working. Move the dial, reboot again. Um, the work we did, which was victim led, um, in fact, an informed to March 15 um, has won global acclaim. Uh, the Gates Foundation point to us as being the leading world authority on responding to an act of terror. Um, there's a Winston Churchill uh, Fellowship research project currently undertaken, again, talking about us as leading the world by taking that impact and um, from the grassroots up approach. Um, so the best way to get some case study examples of some of the work we've done to date is on our YouTube channel, which is, you can just find under the Christchurch Foundation. Uh, Storytelling is a big part of what we do, so there's a series of videos 
that you can view there that give you some more examples of how integrated our programs of work are. Sometimes we're the funder, uh, like you'd see in a community trust or uh, likes of the Tyndall Foundation. Other times we're actually a project delivery vehicle. It depends on the resources here in the city and whether we roll up our sleeves or not. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a look at our website and those YouTube videos and feel free to contact me if you've got any other questions. But ultimately, we hope to partner with other entities here to try out, develop a centre for um, world leadership and philanthropy. There's a lot of great work happening here. We've now got a leadership development programme that works from high school students through into a collaboration with the IOD. Um, and uh, universe, one of our uni three tertiary institutes actually has a, a now a full purpose degree, which um, Bridget might talk a bit about as well, that came out of UC. Um, so leading the world, making a difference, <laughs> which I know you're keen to do too. So thanks for your time. Fantastic. Thanks, Amy. And thanks so much for suffering through the, the week <laughs> after COVID. I know, I think anyone who's had it will realise what it's like to kind of carry on and sit and do such a great job presenting. Um, and I know and Jamie and I get the, have the pleasure of working with the Christchurch Foundation in, in our own office. So um, it's just great work and you can see sort of the impact they're having. Um, and now on to someone else who's having an impact. Um, I'll hand over to Bridget. Fantastic. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Bridget toka ingoa no o te tahi a hou. He kai mahi a hou, iti kangu peni o bed and proceed. He mehe mai o ha uh, tēnā koutou katoa. So kia ora everyone, my name is Bridget Williams. I'm from Christchurch o te tahi and I founded and lead a social enterprise called Bed and Proceed. And I want to say a massive thank you to Matt and to uh, Christchurch NZ for letting me be here. I feel, feel like it's a bit hard done by that I'm the last person to speak after we've talked about space and the these incredible honours with um, what Amy was talking about in response to the mosque attack and now I'm here to talk to you about beans um, <laughs> but I do hope uh, that it will shine some light on what it's like to create a social enterprise in a very thriving creative city that being Christchurch or Tatahi. Uh, next slide please. So beat and proceed, um, just a little bit of background. I did not always, I hadn't always been doing this. I believe it or not, I was a lawyer. I now call myself, I think I'm a fully recovered solicitor now, uh, but for about three years, I was a solicitor and I just found myself in a position where uh, I had got so much, um, I learned so much about community connection and being a part of something that is, you know, bigger than you, but better because of you through my time being president of the student volunteer army, which was a youth lead mobilization, uh, I guess just a huge group that came out after the earthquakes to help clean up the city. And then I was shoulder tapped to be on the uh, Christchurch community board and be a youth representative. And at the time I was one of the youngest uh, community board members for the city, but I thought it was really important for uh, there to be a, a younger perspective around the table, especially when we were making decisions that impact the future of the city and the city being one where we essentially had a blank canvas to work with. And from that, this has become a really vibrant creative city that really values creativity. And for so long, I never really valued it. It was always a strength of mine, but it wasn't something that I saw as being a career path. So I'm really grateful to have been able to carve that one out. So long, making a long story very short, had a bad day in court, decided to put something, uh, my frustrations into something positive, made a necklace, wore it to work the next day, had heaps of compliments on it, uh, discovered the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, put the two together, uh, sat on the idea because I thought it was just, it didn't have legs, I didn't think it, it was, you know, worthy of anything, or I didn't think it would actually make much of a difference, but then the United Nations found out about it, and they gave me seed funding, and uh, then I had businesses contacting me to run, beat, and proceed in their, in their workspaces, and their offices, and retreats, and I thought, maybe there's something to this, so much to my dad's horror, I left the law uh, to paint beads for a living, but it is more than just that. But um, I will tell you a bit about what Beat and Proceed is. So the next slide, please. So Beat and Proceed, what are we? We are a social enterprise that exists to educate people on the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and to inspire action towards them through creativity. And the idea started as a really simple one. 
It was about bringing people together to each make and paint a five beaded necklace, bracelet or key ring in the top five sustainable development goals that you care about personally. And while painting and creating, we are in a creative space where we can ideate and brainstorm ways to action the goals that we care about and also throughout the workplace as well. And of course, you come away with something tangible that anchors the learning. Uh, it serves as a conversation starter and a reminder of your commitment. So that was essentially the idea and it has definitely grown far beyond that. So the next slide. Here they are in all their colorful glory. Um, so you're probably very familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals. They go by many different names, such as the People's Goals, the Moonshot Goals, the Global Goals. Currently, they're being referred to as the world's to-do list. But for this purpose, I'm calling them by their acronym, the SDGs, standing for Sustainable Development Goals, which you have to really enunciate or else it sounds like something else, the SDGs. So what makes them so special is they do speak an international language and they put different countries on the world stage when they are doing bright and bold things towards actioning them. And with that international language, it means you can, uh, you know, you can, you can action them anywhere. And I think now more than ever, and what we have seen with COVID is we need to come together in solidarity and with this collective vision to work towards something that feels impossible, but made possible by us all working together. That's the power of goals and the power of the SDGs. Uh, and so with the next slide, you'll see that like any SMART goal, there's a deadline. You're probably familiar with it. It's 2030. Uh, and the really sad thing is no state is on track to achieving all 17 SDGs by the 2030 deadline. So that is why for me, I see Beat and Proceed as being a wonderful tool to help connect all people, no matter what age, no matter what area you work in, to action the goals. Uh, which brings me to the next slide. Um, so a cool thing with New Zealand and especially with Christchurch as well is we do have quite a few SDG champions and one in particular that you may recognize is the Right Honourable Helen Clark. She's the lovely wahine to the left and she is a huge advocate of the SDGs and in her visit to Christchurch at the town hall I was lucky enough to meet her. We got to chew the fat about the sustainable development goals. Um, and she's a really big um, uh, advocate and supporter of what Beat and Proceed is achieving. And you may remember that she went for the position of the UN right um, Secretary General. Unfortunately, she was unsuccessful. Um, and this lovely gentleman to the right, Antonio Gutierrez, had the position. And that is our former, one of our former city councillors, Raf Manji, who is gifting a Beat and Proceed kit to him. So it's really exciting that we're able to be used as a tool that's internationally recognised. And moving to the next slide. So one of the things that we picked up with Beat and Proceed is while the kit gave anyone in a group of seven the opportunity to you know, come together to work out what five goals they care about personally, there was real impact in us going into businesses and schools and organizations and actually workshopping with them, being guided on that journey. And so I'm really excited to say that to date we've worked with over 7,000 individuals across New Zealand, and that's the benefit of operating from Christchurch or Tatahi. You're really not that far from anyone around Aotearoa. So we've worked with PwC, GHD, other international uh, service firms, engineering firms, Z Energy, uh, and also a lot of schools, as I mentioned, and councils too. So the beautiful thing about the SDGs is yes, they speak that international language, but so does creativity. And that is able to be done throughout any, any age. So with Beat and Proceed in this workshop package, it's called our Beat and Proceed Epic, as we're giving people, hopefully, an epic experience. And it's a three-part uh, sort of approach where we do me delivering a presentation. Everyone gets out into smaller groups where they paint their five goals that they care about personally. And the last part is the report. Because with businesses, a lot of them don't necessarily know where to start when it comes to sustainability, or they don't realize that they are already actioning a lot of the SDGs, and they just need to understand that language. So we go into businesses, we help them align to the relevant goals that they are directly working on, but we also democratize the process by helping their staff and their people connect with the relevant SDGs that they care about personally. And so people feel taken on the journey and they realize that the goals that they care about have an impact in the work that they do day to day. So with the next slide, we have also taken 
beat and proceed to a, a larger level. So we have beat and proceed impact, which is our experience for large scale events like conferences, summits, and, um, and yeah, I guess any sort of large scale event. And the great thing is with this one is still the same thing, deliver the presentation, because obviously there's a lot of information about the SDGs. So it's important we demystify them, we unpack the history of sustainable development, go right back to 1972, and we also unpack the targets as well. But we have a bead and proceed station where each attendee paints one bead in the color of the SDG they want to commit to an action. And then we weave those beads into a stunning beaded mural which is on the next slide. So you'll see some of our murals that we've done to date. And it's just a beautiful symbol of weaving together our collective actions, celebrating diversity and creativity, but it also serves as a really clever and artistic way of visual data. So you can physically see what people care about. And you'll see there's the one with me holding it up with two hands. That's our largest mural we've done to date with over a thousand beads in there. Moving on to the next slide. Awesome. So the cool thing with Christchurch and why there is a real connection with the SDGs is we've done a lot of work towards them. So here is uh, Councillor Sarah Templeton. She is the Wahine in the corner and she is her portfolio is for resilience and sustainability. And I'm really proud to say that Christchurch or Tatahi was one of the first cities in New Zealand to put itself into a state of climate emergency. And the reason for that is it framed our policy and our strategy to make sure that whatever we did, we looked at the lens of SDG 13 climate action in mind. And when Councillor Sarah Templeton delivered her presentation, she sent me this photo and she wore her bead and proceed necklace. And one of her beads is SDG 13, Climate Action. And so that's a big part of what we do. It's about us educating and inspiring people to think about what are their platforms? What can they personally do to action the goals in their life? What are their resources, their connections to make real tangible impact? And speaking on councils, bed and procedures work with a whole lot of councils around New Zealand because long-term plans and policies and strategies, the SDGs are a wonderful tool to help articulate what council values and where they want to put their sustainable impact. And other things that have happened in, in Christchurch in particular is just last year, we hosted the New Zealand Sustainable Development Goals Summit. It was virtually done because COVID, uh, but it was a fantastic summit. And every year we have a summit that takes place throughout New Zealand, where all of the biggest SDG nerds across the country get together to discuss where are we at with the goals. And then interestingly, just last year as well, we had the government's preparedness to implement the sustainable development goals. So this was a report put together by the Auditor General, and it highlighted some really key information. First, that New Zealand does need to articulate on what its targets are and how they will be measured. But the third is that there needs to be more engagement than ever. So I do believe that we will see more push and more desire for the SDGs to be weaved throughout businesses, whether it's private or public sector. But as you know, the SDGs are not owned by anyone. So you could say they're owned by everyone. So we all have a responsibility to action them. And someone that is definitely actioning them is Christchurch NZ. So um, they were a huge um, connector and a big, a big part of the Sustainable Development Goals Summit. And they're doing some awesome work around how businesses can align to the SDGs too. And what's the next slide, please, Matt? Yes, so I wanted to quickly take you through a bit about Beat and Proceed and how we want to walk the SDG talk. So um, in the next slide, if you'll see, and actually might want to go to the next one as well, Matt. Yeah, one more. That's it, perfect. So we want to walk the, oh, sorry, back one. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a fantastic job. Uh, we want to walk the SDG talk. So we have partnered with an incredible organization uh, called Silence. Silence are located in Kolkata, India, and they give quality and safe employment to adults who have speaking, hearing and physical disabilities, often a group marginalized in the workforce. 
And so they give them quality and safe employment and are wonderful artisans. Uh, they make the kits out of recycled paper and our beads are made out of recycled wooden pallets. We work with the Natural Paint Company as our paint partners and our paint partners are fantastic. They, the Natural Paint Company, they are also located in Aote, sorry, in Christchurch, Otatahi, uh, and they are incredible. It's eco-friendly paint, free of nasties, and for every square meter of paint painted, they save a square meter of Amazon rainforest. And I'm really excited to say that since we've done all of our Beat and Proceed workshops to date, Beat and Proceed has saved over 1,000 square meters of Amazon rainforest. And then with our next slide, a key point of Beat and Proceed is our one-for-one -one model. So for every Beat and Proceed kit purchase, another is donated to either a low yourself school or a deserving community organization because we want Beat and Proceed to be accessible to everyone. And we believe everyone has the ability to be agents of positive, of positive sustainable change. And most importantly, a key part of the SDGs and the spirit of the goals is the notion to leave no one behind. So we see that as being a really important part of Beat and Proceed. And that's also why we encourage all businesses to use us as a change, um, I guess, as a change behavior tool, but taking everyone on the journey to connect with the goals that they care about personally, so they can also make sure that they're not leaving anyone behind when it comes to the business wanting to uh, aligned to the relevant SDGs. And next slide. Cool. So yeah, so Beat and Proceed is, uh, yeah, it's a creative, it's a creative social enterprise harnessing the power of creativity to bring action and awareness to the SDGs. And I see Christchurch or Tatahi as being such a wonderful place to have started Beat and Proceed because it, it is, as Amy said, it's so connected to nature. Every day I'm reminding myself about the importance of sustainability, how we must look after it. But what definitely came out of the Christchurch earthquake is this real sense of creativity. And Kiwis have always done things a little, done things a little bit different, you know, we're known for our quirkiness. And so something like this is definitely quirky. Um, it is eye-catching, it's raising awareness about a very important framework. And I'm really excited to see where Beat and Proceed goes next. So with the next slide, I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, thank you for uh, your presence. And I'm here to answer any questions. And if you want to know more about Beat and Proceed, you can get in touch. So thank you so much. Thanks, Bridget. Um, again, amazing work. And, you know, to have, have you based here in Christchurch just shows um, exactly what's going on in the city and sort of and the surrounds. Um, and Last but not least, I will shimmy over and let Amber Marie jump into the laptop and control her own destiny. Um, so Amber's from the Granary and I'll let her tell you her story. Uh, kia ora e um, I'm gonna be looking here, but you may be hearing me from there just for a moment, kia ora. One moment. Just the sound of that. I'm skinning a little bit of feedback here. Kia ora. All right. So I'll start that again. So tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Wai kato tani whārau, he piko he tani whā, he piko he tani whā. Ko tainui toko waka, ko wai kato toko awa. Ko taupiri toko manga, ko wai kato tainui toko iwi, ko te where where te tangata. I nāene e noho ana o ki te autotahi e, e te rauhe o nai tāhu. Ko a Amber Māri toko ingoa, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. <laughs> so kia ora e te whana. I'm Amber Marty. I'm 
incredibly excited to connect with you all today, our Edmund Hillary Fellows. Namahi Christchurch NZ for this opportunity. I shared with you a moment ago, Maireo, the Māori language of my connection to my ancestors in Whenua, my land, Tainui and the Waikato River, which is located in the North Island. In the Waikato, our Whakatoki, He Piko, He Tanifa, He Piko, He Tanifa, and its translation at every uh, bend as a leader represents the correlation between people and the resource and the ceaseless perpetual connection between the Waikato River and our people. With me in this image uh, is ooh, kia ora. <laughs> With me in this image is my amazing co founder, Victor. Victor is a proud Indigenous Tane of both Basque and Galician descent. Recently, Victor and I made the decision to journey south to Otsutahi, Christchurch, the Whenua of Naitahu. Naitahu are the Māori people of the southern islands of Aotearoa, Te Waiponamu, the Greenstone Isle. They hold the Rangatira Tanga or tribal authority to over 80% of the, the South Island, of which the granary acknowledges and appreciate the guardianship of this intensely beautiful Whenua. I'll start at the I'll granary the with the first in Aotearoa to successfully demo a cutting edge LED motion tracked virtual production studio and the volume. And we're the first full virtual production studio creating original IP in this space. But collectively, with over three decades of experience, this spans over 100 projects in the entertainment industry, including Academy Award winning uh, feature films, Emmy Award winning episodic television series, industry acclaimed interactive projects, as well as independent and local productions. In essence, the granary works on both creative and technical IP. Uh, we begin at the concept phase, writing scripts, storyboarding, and creating concept art through the production life of projects, be it onset, shooting live uh, action, behind the camera, assisting with technical delivery, or at a computer, building the physical worlds, utilizing 3D software such as Unreal Engine, Blender, Maya, and Houdini. We are also involved in the post-production and delivery of projects, and we're building both our technical pipeline and a slate of creative projects to take to market. There is a global opportunity within the content creation space with larger audiences than ever and streamers hungry to create new and original content. The screen and gaming industries are set to grow to 260 billion US dollars by 2025. Embracing virtual production is a way that we can safeguard against future production hiatuses, whilst also acclimatizing ourselves to a new remote work future we all find ourselves within. It gives us the means to work collaboratively and remotely with increased efficiency. We can now jump continents at the click of a button without ever having to leave the comfort of a studio. Aside from the LED stage technology, which is groundbreaking, a lot of these tools have been in some shape or form a mainstay of the VFX industry since Avatar, but they have traditionally only been available in the large Hollywood film studios. We believe that by opening up accessibility to these tools to our local industry here in Old Taroa, we will help our local creatives tell bigger and more ambitious stories on a global stage. But why does this matter for Old Taroa? Well, our screen industry has for a long time predominantly been a service focused one, but in a world where IP is king, we really should be shifting this narrative. As an example, Disney did not become Disney by servicing others. They became Disney because they created their own IP and we have the same resources, expertise and storytellers in this country to do the same. To catapult Aotearoa to a highly competent services industry for international productions, we need to invest in our local content creators and creative producers. And we should be placing ourselves as world leaders in digital exports. The granary is committed to Aotearoa, the time is right to move and the, from being just the beautiful backdrop to becoming a more um, a powerhouse global digital leader. So earlier, I just acknowledge that there's this camera here as well. Um, earlier, uh, I mentioned that we made the decision to move to Otatahi Christchurch. Less than a couple of months ago, we moved from Tifanganui Tata. Wellington, so where we had been living for over a decade. Uh, it's a city we dearly love and it is close to our hearts. However, there were several reasons why um, us as a startup, Otatahi was a great place for us to explore. To name a few of the first, um, so just to name a few, uh, the first reason was due to us not wanting to build our company in a bubble. We know how vitally important it is to be surrounded by not only our creative and technical talent, but also those willing to invest into our space within our industry. 
With the convergence of film production, game development, and across reality in the entertainment industry, there's a huge need to educate and develop the talent we need for our industry to grow, which is why Tifari Wanganga o Waitahe, also known as the University of Canterbury, has decided to invest $97 million redeveloping its Dovedale campus into a digital screen campus, an ecosystem dedicated to nurturing future leaders of the digital screen industry. For us, pioneering the way in Aotearoa doesn't mean we have to travel the path alone. Instead, we are here to build community and uplift rangatahi to find opportunities in a growing industry and, and a digital economy. Second, our government has been investing into our regions. So anything outside Tamaki Makota, Auckland, and Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington, is considered regional. There is an active community of local screen practitioners here in Aotearoa, sorry, I should say Canterbury, um, advocating for global opportunities, studio infrastructure builds, training and capability development, alongside the incredible vista that is the South Island to attract international studio attention. There is also active development and investment into the local Canterbury screen industry by Christchurch NZ and Screen Canterbury. Lots of incredible opportunities have been created in what I would say actually a very rather short space of time. Next up was the investment and support we um, had saw fellow startups um, and that, what they were having in the region. So startups such as, uh, here we go, kia ora, so we can see that. Um, startups such as Piper Vision and Partly, you heard from Marion earlier, their journeys have been supported by the Ministry of Awesome. So Ministry of Awesome in partnership with the HTK Group is a force for high growth startups in Aotearoa. What I love is that they are underpinned by the principles of Te Tiriwa Waitangi and collaborative partnerships. So they support early stage founders and startups with global ambitions, both locally and throughout Aotearoa, who have a bold ambition to innovate and lead New Zealand's future. Marion and her team have been positively welcoming to us. Already, we've been invited to breakfast hui's to learn about scaling startup cultures. We've been um, introduced to local founders to build our community, and we've enjoyed cups of tea and connection. Their passion and support is tangible. And once you enter their doors, you become like Fano family. Another big shout out to Marion and her team is the phenomenal resolve they have had and the success of creating and hosting Aotearoa's first female founder conference during a pandemic. I had the fortunate opportunity to share some learnings from my journey with fellow founders. And for me personally, as a wahine, so a woman in the startup world, they created a safe space to be able to develop um, new relationships and community building. It was truly an empowering day. So finally, uh, the city has been going through a big regeneration and transformation period after some traumatic events in the past decade. And what we didn't realize until we arrived here was that what the impact would have been like for those here rebuilding the city and their communities. From what we have experienced, locals have been incredibly welcoming to us without the collective community spirit, uh, one of innovation, and there's a lot of emphasis on building a people-centric city. They are investing into their future and it is a city emerging. A big draw card for us was also the cost of living and the ability to afford a healthy home rental. Um, I've been excitedly exploring the city along the River Avon, visiting the beautiful parks, the botan botanical gardens, the scrumptious food markets. I value the promotion and integration of Māoridom and the design of the city, the details on the buildings, as well as the pathways which connect us. And I appreciate the partnership that the city has created with Naitahu. And just in case you aren't aware, the Pacific Ocean is at its doorstep. So depending on where you live, you may wake up to an ocean view. And what got us um, was that a couple of weeks ago, we were able to visit Auraki, so that's Mount Cook. And it took us less than four hours to reach it in an EV. There were enough charging stations on the route, uh, so we weren't too worried. And for us, we just can't believe that we've, um, we have the epic landscapes that people from around the world travel to just on our doorstep. And yes, uh, we are still new to the city, but uh, we can't wait to strengthen our roots here. This feels like a city of opportunity, one where we can be a part of its growth, its future and its legacy. So you can find us on all the usual media channels. Easiest way is to look me up on LinkedIn. Um, please feel free to reach out to Screen Canterbury and if you work in the film, game or entertainment industry and are keen to learn more about what's going on here in Aotearoa, we can't wait to connect and share with you about all the awesome developments and happenings that's happening here in the screen industry, especially here in Ōtutahi, Christchurch. 
Um, so kia ora e te whanau, tihei mauri ora. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amber Marie. Um, I think as you can probably see, Amber Marie did a much better job than Jamie or I could have done in terms of selling the city to you. So, um, and thanks to all of our speakers who, you know, put together amazing presentations in, in a relatively short amount of time and, and tied it all together perfectly for us. So I'll, um, I might hand over, before we start some Q&A, just hand over to Stephen, um, just to, I suppose, share some thoughts as to what it's like to live here in Christchurch as a as a current fellow. Stephen, over to you. Well, kia ora koutou, ko Stephen. Mo I'll just, um, stop sharing it so that you can see, Stephen. Yeah. You can see me, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's, it's great to be on the call. It's been wonderful to hear all these stories and conversations. Well done, Bridget and Amber and everybody else who was on and shared. And um, it's really cool to hear. I, I, I guess, um, so I'm in the cohort seven of EHF. Um, so that's kind of the connection point. Um, but I also bring a slightly different perspective because I've lived in six different countries around the world. Um, and spent most of my career working in legal area in Tokyo, London, and Sydney. And when we were looking, my wife and I, to come back to New Zealand, we obviously were looking at Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. Where is it going to be? And we chose Christchurch. Um, the, the other background is I have an accent, but I grew up in Christchurch. So we moved here in the late 1980s. So it's very confusing for people, but Christchurch is home. So it was really about coming back to a city that was very welcoming. And I've put some links in the chat um, with some articles because I've been trying to spread the word <laughs> because I think Christchurch is an amazing place to live. And I think actually the earthquakes shook up a lot um, beyond the buildings and the, the land and all the devastating things. It also changed people's mindsets. So I think you see people like the wonderful Bridget here coming through as the next generation, approaching things a little bit differently to how previous generations would. So quite frankly, Christchurch, when I was growing up, was a very uh, white, you know, sort of uh, ethnically not very diverse place, but it's changed hugely since then. Um, so I, I don't have a huge amount to say, except that it's an ecosystem where we all know each other. So I literally know everybody who's spoken or at least have been in the same room with them recently. Um, I volunteered at the um, Electrify conference that was held recently. So I was there handing out the, you know, here's your, here's your um, info for the day. Um, I get involved in Ministry of Awesome events. I go to UCE things, Think Lab, like all of these things are, are happening. So it's an ecosystem where there's an incredible amount of support. And I think that contrasts with other cities that I've seen. For example, Auckland is a wonderful city, but it is bigger and there end up being sub pockets within Auckland, I think. Um, whereas Christchurch, it's, it's, it's small, it's connected. We all know each other and it is a very supportive environment. Um, so I, I work as a partner in a law firm. Um, we've got 75 people in our law firm, so we're not tiny. Um, we've got four, uh, three different offices um, and we're focused on mainly the South Island, but doing work from Christchurch across the country because my practice is a purpose-led practice. So I end up working for people in Invercargill, up to Whangarei, you know, anywhere. So being based in Christchurch doesn't mean I can't have a national presence. So I guess that's just something to emphasize is that it's a small place, it's a small country. And similar to Amber Marie sharing, you know, we bought a house here that literally cost one third of what it would be in Auckland. So if you're looking at your mortgage size, um, it's, it's a very reasonably priced place and you can get to the ski fields in 40 minutes. You can be snow, you know, surfing the same day. So um, I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a great ecosystem and there's lots of things happening all the time, including lunches and events. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good environment, a good place to be. So thanks for the chance to share. Happy to answer questions by email from any of you in the future. Cheers. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, I think that wraps it up from our end. Michelle, I'll maybe just hand over to you to yeah. wrap up or if, if anyone has any questions who's on the call. Yeah, uh, yeah, opening it up to questions, but first, uh, thank you all for the speakers. It was amazing, brilliant content, loving it. Love hearing all your stories and how they've progressed over time as well. 
it's just been nice and it's been nice to meet you in sort of virtual uh, when having read a lot of stories about you as well. But anyway, questions. Any fellows got any questions for them why they are still here, our speakers? Doug. Listen, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, you know, where there's a bunch of uh, fellows that are interested. Uh, I happen to be here in real time and I think uh, just for uh, recording this, Michelle, thank you. There's going to be some other people, but uh, I think you guys, uh, this this was very good. You did a really good job uh, for the attraction process for uh, people that were, uh, were Canadian and we're actually looking uh, at different areas of New Zealand and haven't really decided on anything. But I think uh, the best part of what you did today was you combine the entrepreneurship with the social part of uh, uh, of what you're trying to do in Christchurch, which I think for uh, definitely for my wife and I is very interesting uh, because we're two heads. Uh, one is an entrepreneur, me and my wife's a social, social activist. So I think it's uh, wonderful that you guys actually combine both of those. Uh, and uh, congratulations on the presentation. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. Yeah, and I think just in terms of um, as part of the follow up process, we'll we have all the uh, the economic data that you know that you can find probably anywhere in a, a very tidy report that Jamie's put together. So we'll share that along with, um, or Michelle will share that along with the video um, of and the recording. So yeah, thanks for your comments. It's um, obviously the the speakers did all the hard work, and we just uh, tied it all together. Yeah. Eric, did you want to say anything or does anyone else got any questions? Otherwise, um, yeah, if people want to put their email addresses in the chat to share, I will be sharing it all. But if anyone does want to put their email addresses in there at this point in time, feel free. Yeah, I wonder if uh, if any of the new fellows have any questions. Uh, uh, we, uh, we're in the first cohort and uh, we started in Wellington. Uh, we thought we would be working with the New Zealand government a lot, uh, but it turned out that uh, we ended up uh, moving to Christchurch because uh, when we came down and talked to Christchurch NZ about proposing a uh, space challenge, um, it happened really quickly. Uh, within two, two months, we had about 30 uh, organization co-sponsors. And so um, it was, we were just amazed at how supportive they were for new ideas to and new initiatives to try. And uh, uh, and because we kept working with them over time, uh, we end up uh, just, just coming down here. And, and as, as you heard from Mark Rocket, there's a lot going on in aerospace in Christchurch. And so uh, so we've uh, we've enjoyed uh, and also we we like the so much of the uh, uh, nature opportunities on the South Island side. And um, we, we've been coming, we used to come here to visit New Zealand for adventure travel. We tried everything, bungee jumping, uh, zorbing, uh, you know, high speed jet boats. Uh, and uh, we don't do that as much anymore, but it's nice to have it uh, in the background there. <laughs> we settled down to kayaking now. Nice, that's good. And we actually do have a video of Emily and Eric talking about how they set up their business, um, you know, from a startup perspective, like the actual logistics part of it. So we have got that on the resources um, oh, right. those as well. Okay. Yeah, we still utilize that one, Eric. No. <laughs> Stephen? Oh, Michelle, is it worth mentioning, there's probably close to 30 fellows in Canterbury from yeah. based on my rough calculations. So just in case people are wondering, <laughs> and we do have regular meetups and gatherings, I would say probably once a month, somebody will say, oh, someone's passing through, let's catch up or um, let's have a barbecue. We had a bunch of people over to our house for Christmas um, because being an immigrant, you know, it is hard. You leave your family behind. And having moved a lot myself, I know um, being an immigrant to a new country, you're looking for connections. And, and so I guess there is a, the point is there is a welcoming community of EHF fellows here who I think we're pretty good at supporting each other and also introducing, which is what I view my role as a New Zealand based fellow. How can I catalyze the introductions for people who then, you know, are doing something I don't know about, but I know someone who can help them. So 
Yeah. That's exactly it. No, perfect. Thank you. Stephen is, uh, and same with um, Eric and Emily, they host a lot and they sort of, and what we find is because fellows are starting to come in now over the border, we've just had probably about five through and each city that they're going to visit, you'll find some of the Kiwi fellows or the fellows that have moved to that country now, for that city are hosting uh, meals and it's whoever can turn up at that time because it's going to be starting to come quite regular actually. <laughs> But it's fun. It is great to finally meet people that you've been talking to for a couple of years online.